Welcome to our discussion. Uh, in terms of uh, leading off our discussion, there, there are two facts that I thought are, are pretty interesting that uh, are relevant. Uh, one is that for, for many years, US government data has shown that women are 73% more at risk uh, for injury uh, in automobile accidents, 17% more at risk of dying in an accident uh, than their male counterparts. And so we're here to discuss how is this possible? How is it possible that women are more vulnerable to injury and death in a car crash than men and what can be done about it? Uh, and in many ways, it's really hard to believe that we're talking about this issue in 2021. I, I would certainly have thought that uh, this issue would have been addressed in prior administrations, uh, uh, but this is a new administration and perhaps this is uh, a public policy issue that the Biden administration and the Department of Transportation could take up. And we'll talk about that with a great uh, panel that we have together. First, we have Caroline Criado Perez. Uh, she is the author uh, of a, a best-selling book called Invisible, Invisible Women, Exposing Data Bias in a World Designed for Men. Uh, she's a journalist, she's a feminist campaigner, uh, she's known for getting the first woman on the British banknotes uh, and also the first statue of, of a woman in Parliament Square. We also have Chris O'Connor, who is an engineer by background. He's also president and CEO of Humanetics. That's the maker of those iconic crash test uh, dummies. Those are the devices that are used to measure the impacts on occupants on every car and also every space mission from Apollo onwards. And lastly, we have Susan Molinari, uh, politician, journalist, lobbyist, uh, a five-time representative from Staten Island, New York City, and a CBS broadcaster, uh, and also a public affairs executive for companies like Google. So thanks uh, for each of you for taking the time to talk about this really uh, topical and relevant issue. And Caroline, I want to start off uh, with you. I mentioned your book, uh, and why did you write this book, uh, Invisible uh, Women, in the first place? Um, well, I guess, like you, I started to come across these kinds of examples, because it's not just in crash test dummies, unfortunately, where we seem to be substituting the average man as representative of the average human. And so I was coming across examples. The first example actually I came across was in medicine, you know, which is equally shocking and equally life-threatening. Um, so for example, you know, women are much more likely to be misdiagnosed if they have a heart attack uh, because the female heart attack symptoms don't necessarily conform to what we think of as the classic Hollywood heart attack symptoms of pain in the chest and down the left arm. Um, and so women are less likely to realize they're having a heart attack. Also doctors are less likely to diagnose it. Um, and as I started looking into it, I started finding that this issue of having the average male representing humanity just kept cropping up in areas that you just wouldn't think of from snow clearing to medicine and of course to car crash test dummies. Um, and so this, this was an area that, that for me was also incredibly shocking. So I started to look into it. You know, how was it, as you say, I mean, I was writing the book uh, sort of four years ago now, it came out in 2019. Um, how was it that we were still having this conversation that we somehow had got to a point where, I don't know, almost no one had noticed how ridiculous it is <laughs> to be testing a car that's meant to be safe for all types of people. And we're using an average man as the representative. And as a result, of course, women are much more at risk if they get in a car crash than, than a man in the same car crash. Well, why is this happening? Why are we in 2021 and the regulations are such that uh, there is a crash test dummy for a male driver? And mm -hmm. although there's a crash test dummy for, for women drivers, it's not actually used in those five star ratings that uh, yeah. we're all familiar with when we go to purchase an automobile. Yeah. So, I mean, there's a bit of history here, of course, you know, and I would argue it goes back to this bias that we all shared that you do see cropping up in all sorts of areas where we have this weird thing that we think of men as somehow unisex as somehow gender neutral, which of course they're not, but that's kind of where perhaps it started off. Um, and since, you know, in the history of car crash test dummies, there have been attempts to introduce 
female car crash test dummies. Like back in the 80s, there was a suggestion that we'd want to include a fifth percentile female, which means only 5% of users would be smaller, a 50th percentile female, and a 95th percentile male. The average woman was the one that got dropped out of the, those four, which is a kind of pattern that you see repeating across all these areas that we sort of think, well, we don't really need the women. They're kind of a bit niche. So let's just let's just forget them. So that's how we've kind of ended up where we have a fifth percentile female and then two male dummies. Um, and again, you know, I would argue that perhaps that is also why even though we have this fifth percentile female dummy, who I'm sure Chris will go into details um, more on that actually the one we've been using up until this point is really just a scaled down male dummy and doesn't take into account a lot of the anthropometric differences between male and female bodies. You know, things like women have less muscle mass in their neck and their upper body, which puts them at higher risk for all sorts of different kinds of injuries. Um, um, but as you say, we're not actually using this dummy in the majority of the tests. So in the majority of the tests, even though we do have this smaller dummy, we're still doing most of them on this average male dummy. Um, and, and that is for the frontal test, but also more specifically things like rear impact tests. As far as I'm aware, there is only one 50th percentile male dummy that we use in those tests, even though women are much more likely to experience whiplash, which is what, what you get from a rear impact crash, for example. Chris, let me come to you. Why are women more at risk? What, what is it about women, uh, the way uh, that they're built that makes them more, uh, more uh, susceptible to injury in crashes uh, involving other automobiles? Well, John, there's a lot of variables in, in a crash, as you can imagine. Um, Caroline points up frontal crash, side crashes, uh, rear impact crashes, and there's certainly a lot of variabilities in, in the human being. And uh, there is differences obviously on how we're seeing injuries today uh, with a woman versus a man. And uh, these are well recorded. We've seen uh, an increase in fatalities, we've seen an increase in injuries. Uh, a lot of the injuries, again, depend on the, uh, the circumstances of the crash, uh, do revolve around the, the neck um, and the back, the spine. But also on a frontal crash, we see a lot of lower leg uh, injuries in a female that are, uh, are much more severe than, than a man would experience. And as Caroline points out, I think if you go back in the history of the crash test dummy in the 70s, 60s, 70s, and then uh, what became the hybrid three, which was the third generation, it was scaled around a male. And uh, though there were some changes that were made for that one fifth percentile, it really was the male geometry for which the original crash test dummy was created. And quite frankly, that is well over 40 years ago that it was developed. And even people as you know it today are much different in size and shape, um, as well as technology has advanced significantly over these last you know, 40 years. And unfortunately, we're still using uh, predominantly a 40 year standard. And I think maybe from the 50s and 60s timeframe, it was more uh, envisioned that a male would be driving and a female would be a passenger <clears throat> or in the back seat. And that's how most of the tests are set up. There are some tests where a female is in the driver's seat, uh, but the majority of tests are around a male in the driver's seat. And as we all know, 51% in the US of drivers are actually female. There's actually more female drivers than male. So the standards and the concept have certainly just origin, you know, continued from a historic viewpoint. So Chris, what can be done to make this more equitable? Well, a lot can be done. Uh, in fact, many things have been done. So there is a new crash test dummy called the Thor. Uh, the Thor is built as a 50th and a fifth. Uh, and it's significantly different. Um, it's more anatomically correct. Uh, if you compare the two side by sides, it's uh, very noticeable, the difference in the rib cage, the thorax, uh, the pelvis, the, the areas of concern, because technology has changed. The number of sensors, so data points, you can get channels of data that used to be on a hybrid, you might have 10, you could have 30, 
uh, points of data. Now you can have 150 to 200 points of data. So just imagine all the additional data that you are getting. But what are the design changes uh, specifically for a female based on the injury? If you look at the thorax, the thorax has a single point of measurement in a hybrid three. It now has a four point uh, measurement system that provides a lot more data. The pelvic bone, which is an area of concern in the pelvis, as well as the femur, which is a high injury rate, that has been changed. It has more measurement devices there. Uh, the abdomen, which is another area, especially you know, with seatbelt loading um, on females, that has different sensors. Uh, the lower leg, we mentioned before, has additional sensors. And again, the amount of data we can take off that is significantly more. So by using the most advanced tool, instead of a tool that's 40 years old, uh, OEMs, car makers, uh, uh, suppliers of safety equipment like seat belts and airbags and others can get a lot of data off this. Um, and there's, there's, it is available today. So Europe has now adopted it in their end cap for the male, but they have not adopted the female yet. China and Japan is to follow. And the U.S. is, is still completely uncertain on when they will adopt it. So actually the U.S. has fallen a little behind. Um, but this same technology and all the features that I mentioned are available in a female version. And, and that has not been adopted yet. So we're very slow to get new technology into the testing regulatory process. Susan, is this something that the Congress can do something about? Is it something that uh, agencies can do something about in terms of making things more equitable, making things so that uh, when uh, a woman goes to purchase a car uh, at her car dealership, uh, she knows when she reads the five-star rating that that five-star rating applies not just to a male driver, but also to a female driver. Yes, I mean, look, um, history is riddled, unfortunately, in the United States and elsewhere with um, companies um, and corporations not moving on behalf of the changing demographics until politics gets involved. And there's a number of ways we can get politics involved. But here's an interesting statistic. Now, we've all been talking about the NCAP five-star rating, which started in 1972 and hasn't been updated. Let's look at what our country looks like right now. In 1972, there were 15 women, both in the Senate and the House. Today, we have 143. We have a female vice president. We have Susan Rice, the domestic policy advisor, who says in everything that she looks at, she has now been told she has to take into account equity. President Biden has said he's going to create an office of women for women and children that will be in the White House. So we have all these trigger points now that we did not have in 1972. And I think the time is right for us to bring the attention to these leaders that there is a danger that is out there that has not been addressed by the government, by the OEMs. Um, and I think there's also another point. We all react to the voters and the consumers. And Chris talked about the fact that um, we're not a niche market. We're 51% of the drivers. We're also 62% of the purchases of new cars. So when you put the economy and consumer together with um, trying to impact elected officials and our regulators, I think it's a really good time for us to be talking about this and to bring this attention to the United States Congress, um, to the Department of Transportation, and to the Biden administration writ large. Automakers, Susan, uh, often uh, come forward with uh, new innovations on their own. Uh, but here's an issue where sometimes maybe automakers need to be pushed in a certain uh, direction uh, and pushed, I mean, by regulators. That's right. where the, the government comes into play. Is this something uh, that could actually happen? Is this the time that it could happen with a new administration, with a new transportation secretary, with uh, new bureaucrats essentially in control right. of the levers of government. Yes, absolutely. Again, when I when I talk about when we talk about a, a niche market, as Carolyn uh, talked about, right. we are the people who are more aware than anything that women are not a niche market anymore are the elected officials and, and the people on the Hill, right? I mean, they now saw through several last election cycles that women over 52% of the electorate right now can demand change. And so I think this is the time 
um, car, car manufacturers are, and everybody, I mean, again, this is when you want to talk about that. Women's Health Initiative, we're for years in this country, we only tested on men, the, the aspirin studies, stopping heart attacks, et cetera, all these studies that the taxpayers were paying for only had males as, as um, the people they were testing on because the woman's body was just too complicated. And once there was an outcry, the Women's Health Initiative started and it changed. I think the time is absolutely right with so many women in Congress, with women being the dominant car purchasers and voters to make this change. Caroline, how important is that, that, that public opinion uh, and uh, that pushing coming from uh, women uh, to make these types of changes with these uh, not only auto manufacturers, but even with uh, the bureaucrats, with uh, the regulators to make these types of changes? Yeah, I think it's really important. You know, until people start demanding a change, these changes don't tend to happen. Um, I think the issue that we have is that, you know, women are hampered by a lack of data. You know, one of the best ways that, that we could get automobile manufacturers to actually move on this would be if there were a five-star rating that said, this car did really well on women, but you know not so well on men, or you know the other way around, i.e. sex disaggregating the data. And at the moment, we don't have that. You know, I'm a female car driver. I would like to know when I buy a car, how well did this car do on a female dummy? And ideally an anthropometrically correct female dummy rather than just a scaled down male dummy in the passenger seat, right? I would like to know if it protects me, but because we aren't collecting that data and because we aren't presenting, presenting it in a sex disaggregated way, i.e. You know, separated um, by, by sex and gender, um, women don't have that information. And that makes it much harder for us to be able to vote with our feet, which is really one of the most powerful ways, you know, as Susan was pointing out, we make up the majority of purchases, but we're not able to purchase in a way that drives change. And that is what would be really fantastic. And what would really enable, you know, this great body of women who, you know, supposedly have all this power now to actually exercise that power, you know, in a, in a positive way. Chris, is this- We're not gonna do it in a bad way, don't worry. <laughs> exactly. Chris, is this a, a cost issue? Has this always been a cost issue or does it go beyond that? Well, you know, when, when somebody doesn't want to do something, if an OEM doesn't want to add a new test or variation, it's always a cost issue. Um, it's always going to be more expensive. The car is going to be more expensive. But if you look at a test standard that hasn't changed, the same dummy has been in use with minor changes for 40 years. It's hard to believe. We did an analysis of the most expensive car uh, crash test dummy across all vehicles, and it comes out the pennies on a particular car. And when you look at saving lives, uh, of course, you know I would think pennies are worth the investment in order to do that. If you look at the fatalities across the world at 1.25 million of fatalities, and obviously you can do the proration of women into men in there, which is significant, in the US fatality rate is really kind of stalled for years at 40,000 deaths per year, which is, which is crazy, which is a huge amount that we've just accepted is, is okay. And we ought to be, you know, create, you know, we ought to be certainly upset about that as well as the disparity here that if a woman goes and she's looking at a car as the majority of the buyers, as Susan pointed out, uh, there's no differentiation on whether they're going to be as safe as a man or not. And, you know, that's not right. You know, everybody should be equally safe. And as technology has advanced, we can make cars safer. We have the tools and those tools are there to test, to make sure that they are safer for the different gender differences. And we have to bring new technology from 40 years up to the present. What's the process, Chris, to, to make uh, these changes in uh, our regulations for crash test dummies, for instance, is it a, a lengthy process? Is it something that can be done uh, in, in a matter of a year or two, or does it go beyond that? Well, anything can happen quick if there's the right emphasis behind it. And I'm very encouraged to hear even on this uh, call here between Susan and Caroline, how change can happen in other markets uh, with the will of people. And I think here, um, as women have, you know, a stronger voice and are heard, 
I think there's an opportunity for very quick change. Now, traditionally, it's been very long change. Obviously, if the same testing device has been around for 40 years, even though if you look at how much technology has changed in, in 1980, I could climb inside a car and I could uh, you know, change the belts and the plugs and every part uh, when it was necessary. Today, you have hundreds of sensors in a car that you didn't have before. Technology has changed. Every model year, there's a new advance. And safety has advanced, don't get me wrong. It has continued to get better. But we need to move much faster in being able to measure the safety levels. And as people have changed, and now women have become more um, you know, populous in the driving forum, we need to make changes there that reflect the current population. And, and also, you know, elderly and even overweight people, and I say overweight carefully because actually the new norm for somebody is actually, you know, what would have been considered overweight or, or even obese in 1980, but yet the standard is still around a very thin male or female person. Susan, is this just a, a problem that needs to be resolved, in your view, by, by government, by the, the federal government, or uh, could uh, manufacturers, uh, the auto companies, uh, take the lead here and, and maybe use this as a selling point, you know, uh, for engineering uh, their product so that they can make that as a selling point. Our vehicle is uh, is safe for women. Our vehicle is a, a vehicle that is safer than our competitors for women drivers. What, what's your view on that? So yes to both. Yeah. First of all, I think government has a role to play um, and it has a role to step up right now. On the other hand, I think what it is a selling point and it's not just for women, right? Men go out and buy cars for their daughters and want to make sure that it is as safe as possible. That's what we all look at. I have two daughters who are driving right now. What's the one thing we looked at when they bought cars? Safety. That was the number one thing we had to agree on. If we look back to um, hybrid cars, right? That was a big selling point. And Toyota and Honda, you know, kind of kicked America's butt for a few years until our OEM said, hey, this is a selling point. This can be the same thing. Um, we just have to make sure that they see that as a selling point and step out. I, I think particularly as we're in a point of history where we have a lot of these OEMs and, and people who have not created cars before are now going into autonomous vehicles. Let's make sure that as we're creating the new cars of the future, we're doing it with the mistakes of the past in mind. Caroline, you've studied this issue as it relates to not just what's happening in the United States, but what's happening around the world. And you have China and Japan and Europe. They seem to be leading in terms of safety regulations. And I'm curious, does the US government have a responsibility uh, to regulate higher standards as well so that the US OEMs uh, have this level playing field uh, with our competitors in these other parts of the world? I mean, obviously I'm gonna say yes. <laughs> I, I think that every regulator has a moral responsibility to be making regulations that are going to protect the entire user population of whatever product it is. Um, and and I, I just want to, um, to, to make a point about the, the, the manufacturers. You know, I think that it's right and that this can be seen as a selling point for them, but there also has to be an independent test because we've already seen, you know, when it came to emissions, there were manufacturers who were kind of fudging the numbers a little bit on that. And I would always want to have, you know, an outside independent, you know, whether it's NCAP or NHTSA, whoever it is saying, yes, actually this car is, is safer for women. So I think it's, it's, you know, it's a carrot and a stick, and it's really a good idea to present this to car manufacturers as a selling point, because it, it is a selling point. I genuinely would buy a car that was presented to me as safer for women, but I'm not going to just trust a manufacturer who just tells me that and doesn't present me any data and doesn't have their data checked by an independent regulator. What's your take on that, Chris? Uh, because, you know, as part of your uh, your job, you, you are talking to these various regulators, these government agencies, uh, what, what's, what are your conversations like with them over the years on this particular issue? <laughs> well, that's a very challenging question to answer, but uh, 
Well, let me let me start with the question you were talking about with OEMs versus the government. And I agree. I think you need some checks and balances in place because we've seen uh, we've seen Dieselgate. We've seen uh, some challenges out there on. Uh, when the Insurance Institute insti uh, adopted the small overlap crash and car companies were you know, reluctant at first to do it. And then when they did do it, they did it very quickly and improved safety, but then only for the driver's side, not for the passenger side. So, so it requires a certain level of checks and balances. And uh, like with Dieselgate, uh, it was all confirmed they did it, but you had to run the test to confirm it actually did it. And so, you know, we talk about gender disparity. Why wouldn't any NCAP in the world have both a driver that's male and female? Why do we have to pick one? It right. should be both because we're all going in it. My wife might drive it. Susan brought up my daughter might drive it. My son might drive it. We aren't determining who's driving and who's not driving. So if both are going in, then both should be tested. It's that simple. Test for both the male and the female. Let's not worry about how many are being tested or not being tested. The answer is both. Every seating position should have a male and a female in it so that we can ensure that every seating position is safe, period. I think it's, it really comes down to that simple. So, you know, for me to guess what the governments are thinking or doing, I'm not qualified to do that. Uh, I know that... Um, the technology has been available. The Thor uh, 50th has been around uh, in the U.S. first. Actually, U.S. was the leader in crash test safety from the beginning. There's no question about it. And even uh, some of their ideas certainly uh, project the interest to lead is there with as we develop the Thor. They've had the Thor 50th for six or seven years, and yet they were not the first to put it into the NCAP. Europe was the first, followed by China followed by Japan. So actually the US will, will be the last to the market. And for me, that's greatly disappointing. Uh, and they know it, um, but I don't, you know, there's a lot of politics involved and Susan is probably much more uh, able to, to expand on why it takes longer. But I think public opinion is, is the time is now to, to say we're not okay with delays. And the Thor fifth has been around and yet that's not in. And how can we have the most biofidelically bio advanced dummy in the world recognized by NHTSA themselves and other agencies and not have that in the market. Explain to me, Chris, how this in a perfect world would work if you did indeed have the auto manufacturers uh, take into account that you have different types of drivers in the driver's seat. You have males, you have females, you have teenagers uh, mm -hmm. in, in the driver's seat. How, how would that work in the sense that would there be a sensor that could detect who's in the driver's seat? Would you have to push a button to indicate uh, your, your size so that the, the vehicle could adjust itself accordingly? Uh, just explain what's at, at stake here. Yeah. Great, great question, because by having a single device in a seat, like a male 50th, you only have to develop your restraint system and meaning pretensioners, airbags, seat belts, everything that goes with that around that one standard. And yet you're limiting what the reality of the world is. What should happen is the restraint system should be adaptable. We already have weight sensors. We know the person who's in the seat, how much they weigh. We know how much slack is in the seat belt. So we know the girth of the person that we're trying to get around. We have other technologies that shows even cameras inside the car for drowsiness or for alertness on some of the ADAS systems. They could be used to determine the size, shape, and in the most part, that technology is already there. So with that information, you're asking an excellent question. Why aren't these adaptable restraint systems? We've argued on how much pressure should be on airbag, depending on if you're 280 pounds or whether you're 120 pounds. Well, of course, if you're trying to design one car to work with one person, that's not gonna work. We're not gonna have the safest outcome. But the technology is there to make adaptable restraints and by having a test measurement system that has more than one size required in a seat, now you're starting to make that reality come true in my mind. And if Susan, I could just add something to yeah. that. Sure. Um, sorry to interrupt, no, but no, no, it no. just, 
occurred to me that one of the issues you also have with the adaptability is even though it is sometimes already available, you often have to pay extra to have it. So it's like a surcharge tax on being female. You know, if you want to have a restraint that is adjustable, sure, you have to buy the car new and you have to pay extra to have that bit installed. That should not be allowed. It shouldn't be allowed to, you know, essentially tax someone for having the body that what was it? 51% uh, of drivers have. And I would really like to see a lot of pressure put on car manufacturers to outlaw that practice as well. Susan, I wanted to come to you. I may be dating myself, but I remember when that, that center uh, rear brake light was put on automobiles. I think the nickname was a Liddy light because it happened during the uh, when Elizabeth Dole was the transportation secretary. How long does something like that uh, take to even get that type of change on an automobile, just to get my head around how long uh, what it is that you all are advocating could possibly take uh, to, to get um, this type of procedure put in place uh, for automobiles going forward? Look, I think it depends on the, uh, the patience of the consumers and the patience of legislators. I don't believe that this change would take very long. I, you know, I'm listening to all these arguments and I keep thinking, oh, if I was, the, and I served on the transportation committee, if I was still on the transportation committee, boy, I would be having a hearing on this next week because this is a, an issue that is begging for political attention. Um, and so it should not take that long. I'm curious just to follow up on that, Susan, what can be done by the president, President Biden, in terms of executive action? Uh, I know that he's uh, already signed an executive order. Could this apply? Uh, to this particular issue? You know, I'm not sure about that, but I do know that with regard to the executive order, um, where Susan Rice is the domestic policy advisor, has to have equity in it. Every decision has to have equity in it. And again, once the woman in children's office is open, to sit down with Transportation Secretary uh, Buttigieg and say, what well, you know, we need this fixed right now. So I don't even know that you would need an executive order. I think you would just need pressure from the executive to make this happen. And again, I think this is what we've all talked about this. This is one of these issues that when people find out about it, it will create change. When you talk about change, Caroline, how do you mobilize that change? How do you mobilize public opinion? Uh, does it start uh, literally from the ground up? Uh, does it start uh, with organizations uh, like uh, Chris's? Uh, explain to me where, where, where does it come from both places and coalesces to the point where you, you have uh, lawmakers and uh, regulators coming together to come up with solutions together? You know, I think it's all of them. I think where it starts, and naturally I would say this because I'm someone who talks about data a lot, but it starts with data. It starts with information. It starts with people knowing that this is a thing that exists, a problem that happens. You know, most people, it would not occur to them that we are still in 2021, mainly testing car crash safety on a dummy based on an American male from the 1970s or perhaps even the 1950s. You know, it just doesn't occur to people. So the number one thing is people just knowing that this is an issue. And then it is a case of, you know, lawmakers are incredibly important here, but they need to know that their constituents care about this. So it is a question of calling, you know, in the UK, your MP, uh, in the US, your congressperson, mm -hmm. I guess, um, you know, making them know that you care about this. I think also there is something to be said for making your opinion known on social media to the manufacturers themselves. You know, don't let them get away with this when they release a new car. The first question being asked should be, did you test this on a female car crash test dummy? Which tests did you use that dummy for? You know, they need to be feeling the heat. And that is what, you know, the the general population but also lawmakers can be doing media organizations you know this comes from everyone everyone has to be pushing to to make this change happen because ultimately you know this is something we have been talking about for a, for a while now i mean the general public hasn't but certainly within safety car crash safety circles you know i know chris has been talking about this for a really long time um there may now be some movement because it's been spoken about more broadly um, and, and that I think shows the importance of, of public opinion, you know, that you need to get it known by a wider audience and then you start to see some legislative change. And Chris, uh, Humanetics, what, uh, what are you doing? What can you do to move this uh, particular issue forward? 
Well, the only thing human ethics can really do, John, is make sure technology is available. So we work with, um, with everyone in the community of safety to try to make sure that these test products are available. Getting them in use is, is the next thing. But uh, to revert back on your question, this isn't a complex problem. This isn't putting somebody on Mars tomorrow. Uh, the Euro NCAP, if we use them as an example, they did it. They introduced many more tests of, of pedestrian safety uh, for, for uh, people walking, running, cyclists. They've added multiple levels of uh, added safety over the last several years. And if they can do it, clearly we can do it. I wonder if we make it more complex with maybe too many lawyers in the process because they follow an NCAP process. The NCAP is voluntary. You put that out there, it's not a law, it's not a legal requirement, it's up to you. If you wanna meet the five-star crash rating, then you follow the process. And so we could start as an NCAP of course, we do that. We have a US NCAP. And to put that in doesn't require an act of Congress or presidential you know, voting. It really just requires common sense to say, guys, we need to do it. I know there's a lot of tensions and lobbying and politics, but at the end of the day, um, you know, we've had this product. It's been put into Europe years ago. It could be put in tomorrow into uh, the US NCAP. And the Thor fifth could be put in exactly the same time and quite frankly, give the US an advantage of safety. We can get back to the front with maybe one or two movers in Washington to make it happen. You know, Susan, oftentimes industry uh, views regulators uh, as the enemy. Uh, I don't know if that's uh, the case in, uh, as, it regards, as it regards to this particular issue, but it seems that this is an issue in which the, the two sides, industry and regulators, industry and government uh, lawmakers can actually collaborate together in finding a solution on this particular issue. Yes, I agree 100%. And I, and I want to you know, follow up uh, with what Caroline said. To the people who are watching this, you know, this is one of those issues where if you contact your member of Congress, if you contact your United States Senator, if you go on social media, this will help move this much more quickly. I actually think um, you're absolutely right. I think there does not have to be a lot of tension here. I think there just has to be a lot of attention brought on it. Um, and I think this may be one of the issues that Republicans and Democrats can finally agree upon. And that's the safety of our female drivers. I, I think this can happen quickly. Um, and I think, as I said before, I think everybody's in the right place to make it happen. We just need to bring public attention um, to Washington DC to make sure, because there's a lot of issues that are out there, right? So, I mean, what we're also talking about is fighting for to get, to get in the queue, if you will. Um, and that happens through public attention um, and public participation. So contacting your senators and your members of Congress, um, going on social media means, I want this issue to rise to the top of your action and your attention. And well, I think also what makes it easier is this is an easy win, right? Yeah. Like as Chris says, the technology is there. Um, that's not, you know, all the, you know, perhaps all the progress that we're going to need in the world, but certainly to make things a lot better very, very quickly, that's just so easy to do. Yeah. And if that, if there's one thing I've learned, not from being a politician, but from working with politicians, is that they do like an easy win. Um, and I think that that's another reason to really actually this time, if it's something you don't really like doing, you feel uncomfortable doing, you think, what's the point? I'm just one person. Enough people getting in touch with a politician with an easy win, you know, that is also a way that change can get made very, very quickly. Well said. Well, if now is the time, it seems, to, to try to get that easy win, to try to get that uh, bipartisanship that's uh, so been uh, lacking in Washington, D.C. And uh, Caroline, Susan, Chris, uh, you raised some terrific issues. And, and hopefully uh, the people that uh, can make these changes are listening to everything that you said today. Thank you so much. A really useful conversation. Thank you, Thank you John. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.